Hey there, how's it going everybody? In this series of videos, we'll be going over the basics of Python programming. Now I get a lot of messages from people who say that they enjoy my Python videos, but that they're either just getting started out in programming or coming from another language and would like a beginner's overview of Python so that they can better understand the more advanced topics. And that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna cover how to get up and running with Python, how to work with the different data types, um, how to work with conditionals and loops and iterations, how to create functions, um, also importing modules and and working with the standard library. So basically everything that you need to know in order to have a firm understanding of the Python fundamentals. Now one thing I do want to point out is that throughout these tutorials, I'm going to go over a few topics that I've already made deep, more detailed videos about, and anytime that happens, I'll touch on the basics of that topic, but then reference the more detailed video if you'd like to see more examples. And that will allow us to move along at a good pace. So let's go ahead and get started. So first we're gonna learn how to install Python and set up our development environment. And we're gonna look at how to do this on both Mac and Windows. And this is pretty straightforward process. So first we'll look at how to do this on a Mac, but if you're on a Windows machine, then you can look in the description section below and I'll put a link to the timestamp where we start the installation for Windows and that way you can skip ahead if you want. Um, or if you already have Python installed for your operating system, then I'll also put a link to the timestamp where both of these installations are complete so that you can skip to where we're ready to write some code. So for a Mac, Python usually comes pre-installed. To check if Python is pre-installed, then we can just open up our terminal, and within our terminal, we can say Python dash dash version. Now we can see here that the default Python is Python 2.7. Now it used to be more controversial as to which version you wanna use, but almost everyone is moving over to Python 3. And if you're learning Python, then you're definitely gonna to want to go with Python 3, unless you have a really good reason to do otherwise. So let's go ahead and install the latest version of Python 3. So to do this, we're just gonna pull up an internet browser and we're gonna to go to the Python website, which is here at python.org. And from here, we can go to downloads, and we can see that it already detected that we're on a Mac and has offered up either Python 3 or Python 2. And we want to go with the latest version, Python 3.6. So that's going to download a PKG file, and we will click on this to go ahead and start the installation. Now this is a pretty standard walkthrough here. If you've installed software before, then all, a lot of this will look familiar. So we're just gonna agree to some terms. Uh, you can change the install location if you want. I'm just gonna leave that as the default. And you may need to put in your password to install this. Now once that's finished installing, it will place a Python 3.6 directory in your applications folder. And if we open up our applications folder, and scroll down here a bit, then you can see I have an old version of Python 3.5 here, but it installed this Python 3.6. And if we open this up and look inside here, then we can see that we have this ID or idle application. And we'll come back to that in just a second. So now that we have Python 3.6 installed, let's go back to our terminal and check our Python version again. So if I run that, actually, let me close down the terminal and open this back up just so that we're sure that we're starting with a fresh slate. So now if I run that Python version again, then most likely you're gonna see that it still says Python 2.7. Now the reason is because when we installed Python 3, it actually uses this Python 3 command instead. So if I instead use this Python 3 command and check that version, then we can see that we get Python 3.6 that we just installed. Now, if we want the Python command to use Python 3, then one way we can do this is to create an alias. Now, to do this, we can add a line to this .bash profile file. And if you don't know what that is, then don't worry about it too much. This is just going to allow us to associate the Python command with Python 3. So you can use any editor to edit this file, but since I'm already in the terminal, I'm just gonna go ahead and use nano. And nano is pretty easy for beginners. So I will say nano. Now this is in your home directory. So a tilde means your home directory and then a slash. Now this file is called bash underscore profile. So now let's go ahead and open that up. Now within this file, you might realize that I have some more content here than you do. And these are just some uh, personal customizations that I have, but don't worry about any of this. If I go to the bottom here, and let me like make this just a little bit larger here. Now you should see that whenever you installed Python 3, that it actually added a few lines here at the bottom, and you should have these lines also. Now setting this path variable like it's doing here is what allows the Python 3 command to work. So we'll move down here below uh, to the bottom and add an alias. Now to do this, all we have to do is say alias uh, Python equals 
Python 3. And you want to make sure it looks exactly like this, uh, no space between the equals or anything like that. So now to save this, we can just hit Control X to close, hit Y uh, that, to say that we want to save it, and then hit Enter to keep that same file name. So now if we quit out of our terminal and open this back up, and now let's check that Python version again. So I'm going to do Python dash dash version, and now we can see that it's using Python 3.6. Now, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but you do not have to create that Python alias. If you wanted to, you could just use that Python 3 command to run all of your scripts. But I like to use this Python command, so that's why I personally like to create the alias. Okay, so now let's walk through how we install Python 3 for Windows. Now, if you're on a Mac and want to skip through this part, then you can click on the timestamp in the description below that skips forward to when both of these installations are complete. But this install for Windows actually doesn't take very long at all. Okay, so to check if Python is already installed, we can open up our command prompt by going down here to start and then search for CMD. And let's open up that. And I'm going to make this font a little bit bigger so that we can see here. I think I can click on properties and font and we'll go with something a little bit larger there, okay. Now to see if we have access to Python, we can just type in Python dash dash version. And most likely you'll see that this is not yet installed and get this Python is not recognized error. So to install this, we can just open up an internet browser and go to the Python website, which is python.org. And from here, we can click on downloads. And from this page, you can see that it's already detected that we are on Windows and has offered up either Python 3 or Python 2. Now, if you're learning Python, then you're definitely going to go, want to go with Python 3 unless you have a really good reason to do otherwise. So let's go ahead and go with uh, this download of Python 3.6. So let's go ahead and run this download, and we should get this pop-up. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. Now, this is an important step here. One thing that you're going to want to do is click this option to add Python 3.6 to your path. This will allow us to uh, get by without going into the advanced system settings and setting this path manually. And adding that to your path will allow the Python command to work within the command prompt. So with that selected, now let's go ahead and just click through this installation. And it says that setup was successful. So now that Python is installed, let's come down here to our command prompt and open it back up. Actually, let's uh, close this one down and start from scratch. So we'll open this back up, type in CMD, and open up that command prompt again. And now we can make sure that that installed by typing in Python and then dash dash version. And you can see here that it says that we're working with Python 3.6, so that's good. Now, if we come down here and click on Start, and all programs, then we'll see that we have this Python 3.6 folder here that was installed with Python. Within this folder, we can see that we have a program called uh, Idle. And I'm going to come back to this Idle program in just a second. So when I mention this program, then just remember that you can find it here within this Python 3.6 folder. So that is how we install Python for Windows. Now I'm going to switch back to my native operating system on the Mac, but from this point on, uh, Python is going to work the same for both operating systems, so everyone is going to be able to follow along. Okay, so now I'm just going to go ahead and minimize that. Okay, so now that we have Python installed, uh, now we can begin and go ahead and write our first bit of code by opening up either our terminal or our command prompt. And I'll just close this installation window down in the back here and center this. Okay, so now within the terminal or command prompt, if we just type in Python, then this will open what's called an interactive prompt. And we can see that it shows that we're using Python uh, 3.6. Now, the interactive prompt allows us to write one line of Python at a time. So, for example, for a Hello World application, then we could simply write print Hello World. And we can see that it prints that out. And we can also set variables. So I could say x is equal to, uh, equal to 10. And if I print out x, then we can see that we get 10. Now this interactive prompt is okay for testing Python commands, but we really wanna have a Python file where we can write multiple lines and run an entire script. So let's exit this interactive prompt. And we can do that by typing exit and then opening close parentheses. So to create a Python file, we're gonna need some kind of plain text editor. When we downloaded Python, it came with an editor called Idle. So let's open up that Idle program. So again, on Windows, that's in the Python 3.6 folder that we opened up earlier. And on the Mac, 
It's just down here in our applications, and we can go ahead and open this up. So I'm going to go ahead and make the font a little bit bigger here by going to my preferences, just so that everyone can see, and I'll bump this up to uh, 18 or so. Okay, I think that's good. Now by default, when we open up Idle, this is just another interactive prompt where we can write one line at a time. And you can usually tell when you're at an interactive prompt because of these three arrows here. So to create an actual file, we can click on File and New File. Now this will create a new file where we can write multiple lines of Python and actually make a script. So for our first script, let's just print out hello world like we did before. We can do that by calling the print function and then these opening and closing parentheses and then either single or double quotes and then typing in hello world. Now we're going to want to save this file. So we can save this by clicking on file and then save. And I'm going to call this intro.py, and I'm just going to save this to my desktop. So now I'll go ahead and save that. So now to run the Python file that we just created, we can go back to our terminal or our command prompt, and from here we can type in Python, and then we want to type in the name of the file that we want to run. Now this is relative to the directory that we're currently in. So if we're in our home folder and you saved it to your desktop, then that should be in desktop. And then the name of that file is intro.py. So if we run that, then you can see that it printed out hello world. So we just ran our first Python program. Now I still have this Python file up over here and real quick let me show you how to do a single inline comment in Python because I'll be using these inline comments throughout these tutorials and don't want them to throw you off. So in my script here if I wanted to write a description of what's going on then I could add a comment and to do this we can just start up here at the top line and I'm going to go ahead and write a comment of what we're doing. So the, what it starts with the pound sign and then our comment. So I'll just say print uh, welcome message. Now if I go ahead and save that file and then run this again from my desktop then you can see that it didn't do anything to our script. It still just prints out hello world. So when we actually run our Python programs these comments are ignored. Uh, it's only there for the developer and the programmer to actually see what's going on. Now you don't need anything fancy to run these Python scripts. So if you wanted to, then you could follow through all of my videos using this idle application like we have running here, and then running the script from the command line. But if you plan on doing a lot of Python programming, then you'll likely want to upgrade to a better editor. Now you can use any kind of plain text text editor that you want. You can even use some command line editors like Vim or Emacs if you'd like. Uh, some of the most popular editors, and I have some of these pulled up in the browser here. So one very popular editor is Sublime Text and that's at sublimetext.com. Another popular text editor is Atom and that's at atom.io. And a very popular IDE is uh, the JetBrains PyCharm IDE. So Sublime Text and Atom are text editors, uh, but with a lot of extra functionality built in. And PyCharm is a full-blown IDE, and that will give you a lot of extra features that you might not find in other editors, like the ability to debug a running application and things like that. Now in this series of videos, I'm going to be using Sublime Text. Now I have a full video on how I set up and customize my Sublime Text, and I also have a full video on how to set up and customize Atom. So if you want to use either of those ed editors, then I highly recommend watching those videos. And I'll leave links to those in the description section below. Now one nice thing about using one of these editors is that you can run Python from directly within the editor. So I have the same intro.py file that we just created pulled up here in Sublime Text. And I can run this by going to Tools and Build, or we could have just used that keyboard shortcut. But you can see that if we run that, then we get the same Hello World output that we got when we ran this file from our command line. So to follow along with these videos, you can use the idle application and use the command line to run those scripts, or you can set up one of these other text editors. The choice is completely up to you. Okay, so I think that is going to do it for this video. In this video, we walked through how to install Python on both Mac and Windows. We looked at how to run Python interactively within the terminal or command line, and we also how, uh, saw how to create a Python file and execute that script. So in the next video, we'll start learning about variables and data types. And specifically, we're going to look at the string data type and everything that we can do with those.
But if anyone has any questions about what we covered in this video, then feel free to ask in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer those. Now, if you enjoy these tutorials and would like to support them, then there are several ways you can do that. The easiest way is to simply like the video and give it a thumbs up. And also it's a huge help to share these videos with anyone who you think would find them useful. And if you have the means, you can contribute through Patreon and there's a link to that page in the description section below. Be sure to subscribe for future videos and Hey there, how's it going everybody? In this video, we'll be learning about Python data types, and specifically we'll be learning about how to work with textual data. And textual data in Python are represented with strings. So we currently have open our intro.py file that we were working with in the last video, uh, where we just printed out hello world. And I'll go ahead and run this so that we can see that down here it does print out hello world. Now, this line here is using the print function, and we're passing this text value into that print function. Now, if we wanted to create a variable that holds that text value, then we could say, now I'll just get rid of this comment for now. So if I wanted a variable to hold that value, then I can just create a variable, and we'll call that message, and we'll set that message variable equal to our text value that we passed in to print. And here, message is our variable name. So if you're coming from another language, then you might be wondering if we need to use semicolons or something like that to end each line. But Python doesn't need that. It operates on white space alone, which makes it a very clean language to work with. Now, by convention, our variables are usually all lowercase. And if it's multiple words, then we separate those with underscore. So if instead my variable name was my message, then it would be my underscore message. So that's just a convention that's commonly used. And also, these variable names should be as descriptive as possible as to what values they're meant to hold. So message is a good variable name here because it's holding our message. But if I was instead to call this a uh, variable M, which is a valid variable name, but anyone reading my code now wouldn't know when they see this M variable, what value it's supposed to hold. So message is a much ver better variable name in this case. So this message variable now holds our text data, and our text data is called a string. Now, we can use our variable in place of this string uh, anywhere that we use it in our program. So instead of printing out hello world uh, directly here, I'm instead going to now print out this variable. And that should give us the same results. So if I run that, then you can see down here we still get the same result. Now we can see that I created this string with single quotes. Now you can also use double quotes. So if you're wondering if there's a difference between the single quotes and the double quotes, then it really just depends on what text you have in your string. Uh, so for example, if you have a single quote in your string, uh, so for example, let's create one with a single quote. Instead of hello world, I will instead make our string uh, Bobby's world. Now see, the problem here is that uh, Python sees this single quote within our text as being the end of the string, and it's not going to know what to do with what comes after that single quote here, because it thinks that's where the string is closing. So if you run this now, then you'll get an error. Now there's a couple of different ways to handle this. We could uh, escape this single quote with a backslash. So if I escape that single quote and now run this, now Python knows that this single quote doesn't close out the string and that instead this one should. Now another way to handle that is to instead, so I'll take away that escape character. Now another way to handle that is to instead just use double quotes on the outside of our string, uh, any string that contains single quotes. So if we know that our string contains a single quote, then we can instead use double quotes on the outside, and then it'll know that that single quote isn't the end of the string. So now if we run this, then we can see that it still works fine. But that doesn't necessarily mean that double quotes are better because it goes both ways. If your string contains double quotes in the message, then I would use single quotes on the outside. Now, if we needed to create a multi-line string, then one way we can do this is by using three quotes at the beginning and end of our string. And these can also be single or double quotes as well. So let's go ahead and look at an example. So I'll add three quotes to the beginning and end of our string here. And now I'll just add some text to span some multiple lines here. So I'll just say, was a good, and then hit enter to go to a new line, and say, uh, cartoon in the 1990s. So now if we run that, then we can see that it printed out our string co correctly over multiple lines. Um, okay, so let's go back to our simple hello world example. So I'm just going to take all of that and replace it with our previous hello world example. And now let's go ahead and just run that really quick. So we're back to our starting point. 
So we can think of our string as a string of individual characters, and we can access these individual characters also. So first, let's see how we can find how many characters are in our string. So to do this, we can use the len function, which stands for length. So whenever I print out here, if I was instead of printing my message, if I was to print out this length function and pass in message and then run this, now we're no longer printing out our message, we're printing out the length of our message. And we can see that it says that the length of our string is 11. And if we counted these up, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, then we can see that that's correct. And we can access our string's characters individually. So to do this, we can use the square brackets uh, after our string and pass in the location of the character that we want. So I'll say print message and then square brackets. Now the location is called an index and it starts out at zero. So to access the first character of our string, we can say uh, print the message and then access this index of zero. So if we print that, then we can see that we got the capital H. Now, since the length of our string is 11, that means that with the first character starting out at zero, our last character would be at index 10. So it's our total length minus one. So if I was to say print out the location at index 10, the value at index 10, then we can see that we got our D character, which is the last character in that string. Now, if you accidentally try to access an index that doesn't exist, then you'll get an index error. So if we were to say uh, access the index of 11, then we can see that that threw an index error. Now, we can also access a range of characters. So if I just wanted to get the word hello from our string, then we could say that we want uh, zero and then this colon five, and we'll explain this. So the first index here is our starting point. And the second in that index, which is separated by this colon, is the stopping point. Now, one thing a little confusing about this is that the first index is inclusive, which means it's going to include that value, but the second index is not. Now, there's good reasons for this, but it's still easy to forget. So basically what we're saying is I want all the characters uh, between the beginning and up to but not including the fifth index. And it'll be more clear if we just go ahead and run this. So we can see that it prints out uh, hello. So it printed out our message from the zero index here all the way up to but not including the fifth index here. So we got hello. Now, since our starting point here is just the first index, we can actually just leave that off and it'll assume that we want to start at the beginning. So if we don't put anything there and then colon five, then we should get the same thing. So if we run that, we can see we still got hello. Now, instead, if we wanted to grab the word world from this string, then we could start at the sixth index and then we can just go to the end. And just like leaving off our starting index, it will start from the beginning. Leaving off the stop index just goes all the way to the end. So now if we run that, then we can see that it gives us back the word world. Now what we're doing here is called slicing. And if you'd like to learn more about slicing in depth, then you can watch my detailed video on that. And I'll leave a link to that in the description section below. So now let's just go back to printing out our message. And let me run this. Okay, so all of the data types that we're going to review are going to have certain methods available to us that give us access to a lot of useful functionality. Now, when I say methods, a lot of people wonder what's the difference between a method and a function. And functions and methods are basically the same thing. A method is just a function that belongs to an object. It's not important to get into the details of that now, but if you hear me say method or function, then you can basically think of those as the same thing for now. So like I was saying, the data types that we'll be going over all have certain methods available to us that give us access to a lot of useful functionality. So let's look at some of these string methods. So we can see here that our hello world text is capitalized, but let's say that we wanted uh, that to be all lowercase. Now to do this, it's just as easy as saying print message. And then to lowercase this, we can say dot lower. Now, when we run this dot lower with these parentheses here, that's running the lower method on the string. So when we ran that, we can see that now our hello world has been set to all lowercase. And if we wanted to do this to uppercase, then it's as easy as changing that lower to upper. If we run that, now we can see that hello world is all uppercase. 
So now let's say that we want to count a certain number of characters in our string. And to do that, we can use the count method. And the count method actually takes a string as an argument. So we can say message.count, and now we have to pass in an argument. And it has to know what we want to count in our message. So we'll, for now, we'll just say count hello. And if we run that, we can see that it returns that the string hello appears in our message one time. But if we instead just passed in a single character as our argument, so I'll pass in an L, if I run that, you can see that we get a three because there are three Ls in our message variable. So if we instead want to find the index of where certain characters can be found, then we can use the find method. So I could come up here, instead of saying dot count, I can say dot find. And now this takes an argument as well. It's what we want to find. So let me type in world here and run this. And we can see when we run this that it returns a six. And that's because world starts at the sixth index of our message variable. Now, if we try to find a string of characters that doesn't exist, then it will just return negative one. So if instead of world, I typed in universe and ran that, you can see it returns a negative one because it can't find that anywhere in our message variable. Okay, so now let's say that we want to replace some characters in our string with some other characters. And we can do this with the replace method. Now, first, I'm going to change this, change this back to printing out our regular message. So I'll just delete these. Now let's try to use our replace method right below where we first set our message variable. And this method takes two arguments. Uh, first, it takes what we want to replace. So first, let me just say message.replace. So first, it takes what we want to replace. So let's say that we want to replace uh, world. And now the second argument, which is separated by a comma, is what we want to replace world with. So we'll replace world with universe. So now if we run this, then this might be a little unexpected. We can see that it's still printing out hello world. Now the reason our replacement didn't work is because it's not making that replacement in place. It's actually returning a new string with those values replaced. And we'll learn more about return statements when we learn about functions. But basically, we need to set a new variable here uh, to get that returned string with those replacements. So I could say something like new message is equal to uh, that original method with this replacement. So now if we set that new variable and instead print that new message and run that, then you can see that now it replaced world with universe. And if you really wanted to make the replacement to the message variable, then instead of making a new message variable, then we can just set this same message variable again. So now we're setting the same message variable equal to that replacement and then printing it out. So if I run that, then we can see that now the message variable had world replaced with universe. And this may look a little strange to set a variable to an altered version of itself, but it's very common and you'll be using that a lot. Okay, so now let's get rid of this replace line here. And now let's look at how we can add multiple strings and concatenate them together. So instead of saying hello world, I'm instead just going to set this equal to hello. And instead of calling this message, I'm going to set this equal to greeting. And just below greeting, I'm going to create a variable called name. And I'm going to set that equal to, uh, we'll just say Michael. And now lastly, let's create a message here. And we want this message to combine our greeting with our name. We want it to say, hello, Michael. And one way to do this is to use the plus sign operator. So we could try this by saying greeting plus name. Now, if we run this, then we can see that it's not exactly what we wanted. It combined them together, but it doesn't have a space there. So when you're concatenating strings together, it's easy to make mistakes like this. So what we want to do is add a string between them uh, that spaces them out. So we can add a string between these just by putting in a string literal here. And I'm also going to put in a comma and a space to uh, separate those. And now we also need another plus sign so that we're adding the name after that string. So now we're saying that we want this greeting, which is hello, uh, plus this comma and space plus the name. So if I run this, 
then we can see that it concatenated those strings together how we wanted. Now, sometimes using the plus sign isn't the best way to go. If we wanted to create a longer, more complicated string uh, while using our variables, then adding them all together like this might get hard to keep track of. So let's say that we wanted to add to the end of our message uh, just by you know, closing off a sentence and saying welcome. So to do that, after our name variable, we could add another string that is a period to close off that sentence, a space, and then welcome with an exclamation point. So let's go ahead and run that. Now we can see that it printed out the string how we wanted it to look, but it's starting to get a little complicated on this line here to keep track of all of our plus signs and spaces within our message. Um, instead, with strings like this, it's usually better to use a formatted string. Uh, this allows us to write the sentence as it will appear and put placeholders in place of our variables. So let's go ahead and see what this would look like. So to instead use a formatted string, we can say message is equal to and we're just going to write it exactly how it appears, except everywhere where we want to replace with a variable, we're going to put in a placeholder, and those placeholders are going to be these curly brackets. So we want a placeholder for the greeting, and then a comma, a space, then a placeholder for the name, then a period, and then we'll type out welcome and an exclamation point. And now to fill those placeholders with our variables, we can say dot format and pass in greeting for the first placeholder and then name for the second placeholder. So now let's go ahead and delete this line where, we're, where we were using the plus sign uh, operator. So if we run this, we can see that we got the same thing as when we concatenated them together. But with longer, more complicated strings, this is actually a little bit easier to read. It might look a little confusing now uh, since we're just seeing these placeholders for the first time. But after you get used to this, you will realize that this is easier than keeping track of all those concatenations. And using string formatting like this also gives us some extra functionality. And if you want to see everything that you can do with that, then I do have a detailed in-depth video on string formatting. And I'll add that to the description section below. Okay, and lastly, if you're using Python 3.6 or above, then you'll have access to these new things called F strings. Now, if you aren't using 3.6 or higher, then these aren't going to work because they were only recently released. And not a lot of people are using these F strings yet, but I'm really liking them so far. Basically, the idea behind F strings was to make string formatting as simple as possible. So let's go ahead and see what these look like. So to say that we want this to be an F string, uh, we can just add an F right here to the beginning on the outside of the string. Now instead of using this dot format method, we'll instead just write the variables directly within the placeholders. So I can remove that dot format method, and now we can pass the variables directly within the placeholder. So we'll pass greeting to that placeholder and name to that one. So I can save that and run it. And you can see that using that, we got the same result. And like I said, these F strings are pretty new to the language. So even people who are very familiar with Python may be seeing this for the first time. Now, one reason I really like these F strings is because you can actually write code within the placeholder. So if I wanted the name in all caps for some reason, then I could just come into the placeholder here and say name dot upper and run that directly within the placeholder. If I run that, then you can see that now our name was capitalized. Okay, so we're almost finished up, but I wanted to show you one last trick here when you're learning something new in Python. So we saw a lot of different methods that we could use on our strings. Now, if we ever wanted to see everything that's available to us, then there are a couple of things that we can do. So first we can use this dir function, and that looks like this. And what this does is if we pass in a variable, then it will show us all of the attributes and methods that we have access to with that variable. Now, don't worry about all of these double underscore methods yet, but if we look down here, then we'll see a couple of familiar methods that we used in this video. Um, so, for example, we have dot upper here. We have um, dot replace, um, dot lower, so this kind of gives you a broad overview of all the attributes and methods that are available to you. Now this doesn't show what any of these actually do. So to see more information about these string methods, then we can use the help function. But if we run this help function on the name, then that won't work. We actually need to run it on the string class itself. So we'll just type in help and then str for string. And if I run that, 
and we can see that this gives us a lot more information and I'll pull this up here a bit. Um, so it uh, you know tells us everything that's available to us and if I scroll down here a bit and if I try to find something that we actually used in this video, okay so we have find here. So you can see that it actually gives us a description of what these methods do and what arguments they take. Now, if you know that you had a certain method available to you, but you couldn't remember exactly what it does, then you can actually pass it directly into help also. So if I wanted to uh, find out some more information about the lower method, then we could say string.lower. And if we run that, then we can see that it gives us information and the description just of what lower does. So using that DIR function and that help function is a great way to get a broad overview of the methods and attributes that are available to you. And also what uh, using the help function gives you an idea of what those uh, methods do without actually, you know, going online and checking everything there. Okay, so I think that is going to do it for this video. I hope that now you feel comfortable with uh, working with strings and are familiar with some of the useful things that we can do with those. In the next video, we'll be learning how to work with numbers in Python uh, and specifically, hey there, how's it going everybody? In this video, we'll be learning how to work with numeric data in Python. And numbers are most commonly represented with integers and floats. And the difference between an integer and a float is that an integer is a whole number and a float is a decimal. So to see an example of this, let's create a variable called num and let's just set this equal to three. Now, Python has a built-in function called type where we can see the data type of an object. So if we print out the type, of num and run this, then we can see that it returns that that is of the class integer. Um, now, if we were to set this number instead to 3.14 and now rerun this, then we can see that now the type of number is a float. So that's the main difference between an integer and a float. Now, when working with numeric data, it's common that you'll need to use some basic arithmetic. So let me grab some comments from my snippets here, uh, just so that we have a reference for everything that we can do. So I'll copy these arithmetic operators and paste these in. And now let's go ahead and just run through each of these. So the first four we've likely already seen a lot and are familiar with. So for example, addition, we, if we print it out three plus two, then we can expect that that's equal to five. If we print out three minus two, that should be one. Three times two should be equal to six, and three divided by two should be equal to 1.5. Now for division to behave this way, this is actually new in Python 3. If you're running Python 2, then this will actually equal one because it drops the decimal. But in Python 3, that gives us the right answer of 1.5. Now, if we don't want to drop that decimal, then we do have a floor division, and floor division can be performed by adding two division signs. So if I run this, then now we can see it drops that decimal and it's equal to one. So if you ever see these two division signs, then that is this floor division. Now, if you wanted to work with exponents and powers, then we can use these two multiplication signs. Uh, so if we wanted to print three to the second power, then we could just say, three with these two multiplication signs. And if I print that, then we can see that that equals nine because three squared is equal to nine. Now this last operator here is called a modulo operator and it gives us the remainder after a division. So three mod two will have a remainder of one because two goes into three once with one left over. So if we say three mod two and run that, then we can see that that is equal to one. Now, a common use case for this is to tell if a number is even or odd. Uh, now, the reason for this is because every time you divide a number by two, there are only two possible remainders. It's either going to be zero or one. So, for example, if we look at a few more examples here, so let me just uh, print out a few more module operators, and I'll do two mod two, three mod two, four mod two, and five mod two. So, if we run this, then we can see that two goes into two once with no remainders, that's why we get a zero. Uh, two goes into three once with one as a remainder. So two goes into four twice with no remainder. And two goes into five twice with one as a remainder. So we can see from this pattern that if you do a mod two on any number and there is no remainder, then that number is even. If you do a mod two on any number and the remainder is one, then that number is odd. And that's a pretty common check that you'll use a lot throughout Python programming. 
Okay, so now let's look at the order of operations. Just like we would expect, we can also use parentheses to change the order of operations, just like with normal arithmetic. So, for example, if we were to say, let's see, 3 times 2 plus 1, then with the normal order of operations, we would multiply 3 and 2, which would give us 6, and then we would add 1, which would give us 7. So if we run that, then we can see that we got 7 as our answer. But if I put a parentheses here around this 2 plus 1, then now with normal arithmetic, the way that this would work is that it should first add up these numbers in the parentheses, which should give us 3, and then 3 times 3 should give us 9. So now if we run this, then we can see that we got 9, so the order of operations does work correctly within Python like we would expect. Okay, so now let's look at another common operation that you'll see a lot, and that is incrementing a variable. So if I make a variable here called num, and I set this equal to 1, then what are some ways that we can increment that value by 1? Uh, well, one way that we could do this is to say that num is equal to num plus 1, and if we print out that num, then we can see that it did increment it by 1, and now it's equal to 2. But incrementing values is such a common operation that there is a shorthand for this. So instead, we can just say num plus equals 1. So if we run that, then we can see that it still incremented that value up to 2. And you can use this syntax with the other operations as well. So instead, if we were to say num times equals 10 and ran this, then we can see that we got 10 because it took our original number and multiplied 1 by 10. Um, okay, so a couple more things here. Uh, we also have some built-in functions available to us to work with numbers. And one of these is ABS for absolute value. And basically, this will just remove the sign from any negative numbers. So if I took the absolute value of negative 3, and I'll just clean up a couple of lines there. Okay, so if we were to print out the absolute value of negative 3 and run that, and we can see down here that we just got the absolute value, which is 3. Now, another built-in function that we have is round. And by default, this will round our values to the nearest integer value. So if we said print the round of 3.75 and run that, then we can see that 3.75 rounded up to 4. And we can also pass a second argument into our round function that tells it how many digits that we want to round to. So if I put in a comma here and pass in a 1 as a second argument and now run this, then what we're saying is that we want to round to the first digit after the decimal. So we can see that that rounded to 3.8. Okay, so another common thing that you need to do when working with numbers is to use comparisons. Now, we'll want to know if two values are equal, greater than, less than, and all of that. So to test this, we can use comparison operators. And I have some comments over here in my snippets with the comparison operators as well. And I'm just going to uh, paste over the arithmetic operators that we've already gone over and paste those in. Now, these comparisons are going to return booleans, which are true false values. And we'll be learning more about booleans in a future video when we go over conditionals, but we'll see them here for the first time. So let's say I have two variables here, and we'll just call these two variables num1 and set that equal to 3, and we'll do num2 is equal to 2. So now let's run through all of these comparisons. So First, let's say that we wanted to check if these two variables were equal. So I could say num1, and you can see up here that the equals comparison is double equals. Now, you don't want to use the single equals because the single equals is this assignment here. So the double equals is comparison. The single equals is assignment. So we want to compare. Is num1 equal to num2? And if we run that, and we can see that it returns false because those two values are not equal. Now, if I wanted to check if they weren't equal, then I could use the exclamation point before the equal sign here, exclamation point equals. And if we run that, then we can see that we got true because these two values are not equal. Now, I can check if num1 is greater than num2 by using the greater than sign. So I can save that and run it. And we can see that we got true because num1 is 3, num2 is 2, so 3 is greater than 2. And if you wanted to check less than, then you can just use the less than sign. So if we run that, you can see we got false. 
And you can also use the equal signs with these as well. So if I wanted to check if this was greater than or equal to, then we could run that. We can see that it's true. And if we wanted to check less than or equal to, then we can use those as well. And if we print that, we can see that we got false. Okay, so now we're going to look at one more thing. And I'm just going to delete these in order to get some more room. Now, I will have these comments up on my GitHub page if you want a re reference to the arithmetic operators and the comparisons that we just looked at. Okay, so in the last video, we learned about strings. Now, it's possible that you have something that looks like a number, but it could actually be a string. So let's look at a problem that we can run into if that's the case, and then we'll see how to solve it. So let's say that you have some variables that look like numbers. So maybe we read these in from a text file or got them from a website or something like that. Um, so just to give an example, let's recreate our num1. But this time, we're going to set these equal in uh, single quotes here. We'll set this to 100. And num2 will set equal to, inside single quotes, 200. So I explicitly set these equal to strings, so it's obvious to us that they're strings, but it might not be so obvious to us if we got these values from somewhere else. So now let's say that we want to add these values together. So if I was to say print num1 plus num2, and if we run this, then we can see that this isn't the result that we thought it would be. Now, if you remember from our string video, when we add strings together, it just concatenates those together. So this is what we would expect with strings, but with numbers, we would expect this to be 300. So in order to turn these into integers, we're going to have to do something called casting. And casting is super easy in Python. So to cast these values from string to integers, then we'll just add a couple of lines here, and I will copy these. And we'll just say that num1 equals int num1. So we just casted that to an integer. And we can do the same thing here with num2. So now, if we save that and run it, then we can see that we got 300. So if you have an integer that's actually a string and you want to cast that to an integer, then you can wrap that string in this int function or this int class here to create an integer. Okay, so I think that is going to do it for this video. I hope that now you feel comfortable working with integers and floating point values. And in the next video, we'll be learning about lists, sets, and tuples, which basically allow us to hold sequences of data and is extremely useful to learn how to use Python. Hey there, how's it going, everybody? In this video, we'll be learning about lists, tuples, and sets in Python. Now, lists and tuples allow us to work with sequential data, and sets are unordered collections of values with no duplicates. And we'll look at all of these to see exactly what that means. So first, let's look at lists. And we're going to spend a majority of the time on lists just because it has a lot more functionality than the other data types. So just like the name implies, it allows us to work with a list of values. So for example, let's say that I wanted a list of courses. So I could create a variable here called courses. And to create a list, we're going to use these square brackets. And within these brackets, we put each value that we want separated by a comma. So for example, let's say that we wanted a list of courses. So I'll say history and math and physics. And also, lastly, we'll put in comp sci. So now, if we print out this list, so I'll print out courses and run that, then we can see that it prints out our entire list. Now, if we wanted to see how many values are in our list, then we can get this by using the len function, which stands for length. So if instead we print out the length using len of courses and run that, then you can see that it says that we have four values in our list. And we can access each of these values individually. So first, let's go back to just printing out our list and running that. So now to access the values in our list, we can use square brackets after our list and pass in the location of the value that we want. So we can put in square brackets, and this location is called an index, and it starts at zero. So to access the first value of our list, we can access uh, the location at index zero. If I print that, then we can see that we get history. Now, since the length of our list is four, that means with the first value starting at index zero, then the last value will be at index three. So it's our total length minus one. So let's say I wanted to grab the last value for my list, which is comp sci. I could count these indexes out and see which one should be able to access it. So zero, one, 
two, and three, the third index. So if I print out courses three and access that index of three and run that, then we can see that we printed out CompSci. Now we can actually use negative indexes too, and negative indexes will just start from the end of the list. So since zero is the first item of our list, I can also get the last item of our list using a negative one. So if we print out courses uh, index of negative one and run that, then we can see that we got comp sci again, which is the last item. It's more convenient a lot of the time using a negative one to get the last item because we don't have to worry about what the length of the list is. So for example, if my list grew by 10 items, then the third index would no longer be the last item, but the negative one will always be the last item. And also, if you accidentally try to access an index that doesn't exist, then you'll get an index error. So in this example, if we tried to access an item at index four and run that, since there is no index four, you can see that we get this list index out of range. Now, instead of only grabbing one value, we can also access a range of values. So if I wanted to grab the first two values from this list, then I could say that I want to access starting at index zero and go to, but not including, index two. So this first index is our starting point, and the second index, which is separated by this colon, is the stopping point. Now one thing that's a little confusing is that the first index is inclusive, but the second index is not. And there's good reasons for that, but it's easy to forget. So what we're saying here is that we want all of the values between the beginning and up to, but not including, the second index. So if we run this, then we can see that it printed out history and math because it printed out zero and one all the way up to two, but not including two, which is physics. Now, since our first index here is just the start of the string, we can actually just leave that off and it will assume that we want to start at the beginning. So if we said print the courses with nothing there, colon two, and run this, then you can see that we get the same result because it just assumed that we wanted to start at the beginning. Now, if we just wanted to grab physics and comp sci from this list, then we can say that we want to start at index two and then put in our colon. And now, just like our starting index, if we don't put anything here, then it's going to assume that we want to go all the way to the end of the list. So if I run this, then you can see that it printed out physics and comp sci because it started at our second index, which is physics, and just went all the way to the end. Now what we're doing here is called slicing, and if you'd like to learn more about slicing in depth, then you can watch my detailed video on that, which shows you how you can skip values, go in reverse, and things like that. And I'll leave a link to that video in the description section below. Okay, so let's look at some list methods that we have available to us that allow us to modify our list. So first, let's say that we wanted to add an item to our list. There are a couple of ways we can do this. So first, if we just wanted to add an item to the end of our list, then we could use the append method. So let's say that we want to add art to our courses. So we can just say courses.append, and we want to append art. So now if I remove this slicing and just print out our courses list and run that, then you can see the art was appended here to the end of the list. Now, if we wanted to instead add art to a specific location in our list, then we could instead use the insert method. Now, insert takes two arguments. First, it takes the index where you want the to insert the value, and then the value itself. So if I wanted to insert art to the beginning of our list, then we could say courses dot insert and now the first argument is the location so let's just say location zero which is the beginning and then the value that we want to insert which is art so if we run this now we can see that art was inserted at position zero now that only inserted the value it didn't override anything so you can see that all the other courses are still here but they just got shifted now, another way of adding values to our list is using the extend method. Now, sometimes this confuses people, so let's look at what this does. So we want to use extend when we have multiple values that we want to add to our list. So for example, let's say that we have another list here called courses2, and we'll set this equal to another list uh, with art and education in this list. 
and we want to add these values to our original courses list. So first, let's see what happens if we use this insert method. So instead of inserting art to the beginning of our list, let's instead insert these courses to the beginning of our list. So let's go ahead and run this. So we can see that at the beginning of our list that it actually added the entire list of courses to and not each individual value. So we can actually have a list within a list like we have here. So if we were to print the first value of our courses list, so I'll print out the index of zero and run that, then we can see that now the first value is actually this list itself. But this isn't really what we wanted. We wanted to add all of those values from our second list to our original list. Now that is why we use the extend method. So let's go ahead and set this back to the way it was to just print the courses. Now instead of inserting here, we'll instead use extend. And it only takes one argument, which is the iterable. So we will extend courses with courses two. So now if we run this, then we can see that when we did courses.extend with courses two, that it added the values from our second list uh, here to our original. So a lot of people get that mixed up with append and extend. So again, uh, if you were to append it, just like with insert, then it's just going to append the list itself on there instead of the each individual item. So if we use extend, then now we can see that each individual item is extended onto that list. Okay, so now let's look at how we can remove some items or remove some values from our list. Now, one way to remove values is to just use the remove method. So if we were to say courses.remove, then let's say that we wanted to remove math. So if we save that and run it, then we can see that math was removed from the courses list. Now there's also a way of removing values with this pop method. So if we say courses.pop, now by default, this will remove the last value of our list. Now this is useful if we want to use our list like a stack or a queue. So if we run this like it is, then we can see that comp sci was popped of our, off of our list. And now we just have these three courses. Now, one other thing about pop is that it returns the value that it removed. So we can actually set a variable uh, and grab that returned value. So if I set a variable here and say popped equals courses.pop, and then I was to print this above our courses here and run that, then we can see that it grabbed that comp psi value that was popped off of the list. So if you had a stack or a queue, then you could go through and just keep popping off values until your list is empty. Okay, so now let's look at how we can sort our list in a couple of different ways here. So first of all, let's say that we just wanted to reverse our list as it currently is. Now this is pretty easy. So we can just use the reverse method. So I, I can say courses.reverse. And if we run this, then we can see that now it prints out our uh, courses, but in reverse. So the last item all the way up until the first item. Now, instead of reversing our list, what if we wanted to sort our list? Now, sorting is just as easy. We can just use the sort method. So I'll save that and run it. And you can see that now our list is sorted in, in alphabetical order. So comp sci, history, math, physics. Now, if our list contained numbers, then it would sort those in ascending order. So let me call, uh, create another list here of numbers. I'll just call that nums. I'll set this equal to some random values. So I'll say one, five, uh, four, and three, and we'll save that. Now below courses, we will just say nums.sort. And we will also print these out. So I'll grab that variable, print those out, and run that. So now we can see that our strings were sorted alphabetically, and our numbers were sorted in ascending order. Now what if we wanted our values sorted in descending order? Now one way you might think to do this is just to use our reverse method on the list after they're sorted, and that would work, but there's an easier way to do this. Uh, instead, we can just pass an argument to our sort method called reverse. So if I come up here to the sort method, and I pass reverse is equal to true, and let me also grab this for our num sort. And if I run this, you can see that now these sorted are in descending order. They're sorted in reverse order. Now, one thing to notice here 
is that we don't need to reset our variables when we call most of these methods. It's just altering the list in place. But there's also a way that we can get a sorted version of our list without altering the original list. So what if we wanted a sorted version of our courses list without uh, altering the original? So to do this, we can use the sorted function. So instead of calling this sort method on our list, we'll instead use this sorted function. And I'll pass courses in to sorted there. Now, if we run this as it is, then we can see that our list is not sorted. It's exactly how uh, we described it up here. Now that's because the sorted function doesn't sort the list in place. It returns a sorted version of the list. So to get that sorted list, we have to make a new variable and set it to the return value of the sorted function. So I could just call this sorted courses is equal to the sorted version of that courses list. And now if we copy that and print that out, so now we can see that this sorted courses is equal to the sorted version of that list. So that's really useful because a lot of the times you won't want to alter your original list in any way. Um, so using this sorted function is a nice way to get a sorted version of that list without altering the original. And other than this sorted function, there are a couple more useful built-ins uh, that we can use with these sequences. So let's look at a few of these. So we'll look at min, max, and sum. So it's probably pretty obvious what these will do, but if I wanted the minimum value of our numbers list here, then let me comment out where we're printing out nums. So a built-in function that we can use is just min and call min on our sequence of numbers. And if I run that, then you can see that it returns one as the minimum number of that list. And if we wanted the max value of that list, then we could use max. And if I run that, you can see it returns five. Um, now, if we wanted to print the sum of that entire sequence, then I can just say sum of numbers. If I print that, then it gets 15 because one plus five plus two plus four plus three is equal to 15. Okay, so lastly, let's see how we can find some values here within our list. So let me go ahead and clean up here a little bit and uncomment out that. So if we wanted to find the index of a certain value, then we can use the index method for this. So if I wanted to find the index of comp psi in our list, then we could just print out courses.index and then search for comp psi. Now, if we run this, then we can see that we got three. And three is the index where it found that comp psi value. Now, if we try to find the index of a value that doesn't exist in the list, then we'll get a value error. So if we search that original list of courses for art and run that, then we can see that we got a value error and it says art is not in the list. Now, if we just wanted to simply check if the value was in our list and simply get back a true or false result, then for this, we can use the in operator. So if I wanted to check if art is in our list, then I could say art in courses. So if I run that, then we can see that we got false. But if instead we said math in courses and ran that, then that returned true. Now this is going to be especially useful once we go over the topic of conditionals and if else statements and we're going to go over those in a couple of videos and we can also use this to loop through values of our list by using a for loop so if i was to say for item in courses and then scoot that over then we will just print out that item now, this is the first time in our series that we've indented a block of code. Basically, what we're saying here is that we want to create a loop where we're looping through each value of our list. And each loop through, this item variable will be equal to the next item in the list. So that's why this line is indented, because it tells us that this code is executed from within our for loop. So if we run this, then we can see that it prints out each item of our list. Now, the reason it prints them all out on a new line is because by default, the print statement goes to a new line each time it's executed. Now, this item variable is just a variable. It's not a keyword or anything. We can name this anything we want. So instead, if we wanted to, you know, call this course for course and courses and print that out, then you can see that we get the same result.
So we can access each value as we're looping through, but sometimes it might be useful to also have the index of what value we're on. Now to do this in Python, we can access the index and the value by using the enumerate function. So I will say enumerate and I will wrap courses within that enumerate function. And this enumerate function returns two values. It returns the index that we're on and the value. So instead of just getting the course here, we're also going to need to get the index. So I'll call that index. So for index course in enumerate courses. And now if we print out that index and the course and run that, then you can see that we had access to each index and value as we're looping through our list. And if we don't want to start at zero, then we can pass in a start value to our enumerate function. So if instead we wanted to start at one, then I can pass in the second argument, say start is equal to one. Now if I run this, then you can see that now our starting value is one. Okay, so there is one more thing that I want to go over before we move on to tuples and sets. So it's pretty common that we'll want to turn our list into strings separated by a certain value. Now to do this, we're actually going to use a string method called join, and we're going to pass in our list as the argument. So for example, let's say that we wanted to turn our list of courses into a string of comma separated values. So we can say course string, and that'll hold the string version of our courses. And now we'll type the string that we want to separate each item of our list. So I want these to be comma separated. So I'll put in a string of a comma and a space. And then I'm going to use the join method to join the values of the list using this string. So I'll say dot join and I want to join my courses on that string. So now if I come down here and print that string version of our courses and run that, then we can see that we get our values comma separated. And if we want to change this, then we can just change our string within uh, that we're joining on. So if we wanted to hyphenate these, then I could just change this to space hyphen space and run that. And you can see that when we ran that, now we're separating these by the hyphen. So this is just one long string with all of our list values joined together. Now we can also do the reverse of this and turn a string back into a list. So we can do this by splitting our string on a certain value. So if I split the string that we just created, so let me create a new list here and I'll set this equal to the string version of our list and I'll do a dot split and I'll split it on a space hyphen space. So if we look at the string version that we have down here, this is just one whole string. What that's saying is it's saying, hey, split up all of these values on this space comma space and make a list out of all those values that you get. So now if we print out our new list, so I'll print that new list and run that, and you can see that now we're back to the original list. Okay, so I know that that was a lot to take in because there's so much that we can do with lists, but now let's move on to tuples and sets. Um, now that we're familiar with lists, then these will probably go pretty quickly. Okay, so tuples are very similar to lists, but with one major difference. So we can't modify tuples. Now in programming, this is called mutable and immutable. So lists are mutable and tuples are not. They are immutable. So let's look at what this means. So I'm going to grab a quick snippet of code here from my snippets file uh, just to compare these. So I'm just going to grab from here all the way down to here and just go ahead and paste those in. So first we have a regular list here that we've already looked at. And we're gonna look at one issue that you might run into with mutable objects. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating our list of courses and I'm calling this list one. And then we're creating another variable here called list two. And we're setting that equal to list one. And then we're printing out both of these. So if I run this, then we can see that both list one and list two have the same values. So now let me uncomment out this code where we're changing a value in the first index of list one and then reprinting our values again. So now if I run this, then we can see here that all we did was change the value at the first index of list one. But by changing list one's first value, it also changed list two. And the reason for that is because they're both the same mutable object. Now, if you need to modify your list, then this mutability is what you want. 
But if you want a list of values that you know aren't going to change, then we can use a tuple. So let's look at a tuple example. So I'm going to comment out our mutable example here and then uncomment out our tuple example. So a tuple looks almost exactly like a list, but instead of the square back brackets, we're using instead using these parentheses. And after we create our tuple, we're doing the exact same thing. We're calling a uh, creating a variable tuple one that is a tuple, and then we're setting this tuple two equal to tuple one. And for now, I'll just comment out where we're changing that first value, and I'll run that, and you can see that both of these tuples are equal to the same list of values. But now, if we try to change that value at the first index of tuple one, just like we did with our list, if we run that, then we can see here that we get an error, and it says type error, tuple does not support item assignment. And that's because it's immutable. Um, so now, since a tuple is immutable, it doesn't have nearly as many methods as a list because a lot of those list methods that we looked at involved mutating the values. So we can't append, we can't remove anything or anything like that. But other than that, they behave pretty much the same. We can loop through tuples, we can access values, and all the other things that we've already seen except for what mutates the list. So that's basically the difference between list and tuples. Um, if you need something that you can modify, then use a list. But if you just want something that you can loop through and access, then you might want to think about a tuple so that you don't run into the issues that we just saw. Okay, and lastly, let's look at sets. Now, sets are values that are unordered and also have no duplicates. So let me grab a sample from the snippets file here um, that we can see. So I'm just gonna go ahead and grab this small snippet and paste that in. So we can see that this looks similar to lists and tuples, but instead of the brackets or parentheses, we're instead using these curly braces. Now, if I run this code to print this set out, then we can see that it prints out the values, but if you notice here, these aren't in the order that we added them. So we had history first here, and it has history last down here. And if I run this a couple more times, then we'll see that you know this order can change with each execution. Now the reason for this is because unlike our lists or tuples, sets don't really care about order because some of the main uses for a set is either to test whether a value is part of a set and also it's used a lot to remove duplicate values because sets throw away duplicates. So first let's look at how to get rid of duplicates. So if I add another math course here to the end of our set, and now if I rerun this, then we can see that we still only have four courses. It got rid of that second math course and it just left us with the one. Now, another thing I mentioned was that it's used to test whether a value is part of a set. Now, this is called a membership test. So sets do this a lot more efficiently than lists and tuples. So what I mean by this is that within our print statement, if I was to say um, math in, CS courses, and I run that, then we can see that it prints out true. Now we could do that with lists and tuples also, but sets are optimized for this. Okay, and lastly, something else really useful that sets can quickly do is determine what values they either share or don't share with other sets. So for example, let me create another set called art courses, and I'll create this pretty similar to CS courses here. Um, but instead of physics and comp sci, I'll instead say art and design. And with both of these, I'm going to go ahead and take out that extra uh, math on the end, just so it's a little bit more clear. And instead of this being CS courses, I'm going to call this set art courses. So now we have two different sets here, and some of them have different courses, and some of the courses are the same. So let's say that I wanted to see what courses these sets had in common. So to do this, we could use the intersection method. So we can say cscourses.intersection, and we will pass in the art courses into that. So if we run that, then we can see that it shows us that the history and math courses are in both of those sets. And if I wanted to see what courses are in the CS courses but not the art courses, then I could use the difference method. So instead of intersection, I will instead say difference. So if I run that, then now we can see that it shows that the 
uh, physics and comp sci courses weren't in the art courses. Now, if I wanted to combine both of these sets and print all of the courses offered, then I could use the union method. So I'll say cscourses.union, and we want to union with the art courses. So if I run that, and we can see that now we get all of the courses printed out from both sets. So sets can definitely be useful for these kinds of use cases. And for these particular problems, they're much more performant than lists or tuples. Okay, so we are basically finished up with this video, but let me show you one last thing before we close this out. And that's going to be how to create empty lists, tuples, and sets. So I have these over here in my snippets. So let me grab these real quick and copy and paste these over here and bring this down a line. So I wanted to show this because there's a small gotcha when it comes to creating an empty set. So to create an empty list, we can either set it equal to empty square brackets, or we can use this built-in list class. And to create an empty tuple, we can use these empty parentheses or this built-in tuple class. Now to create an empty set, we actually can't use these empty curly braces. Um, so this line right here is wrong. That's not an empty set. This is actually going to create an empty dictionary. So to create an empty set, the way to properly do this is to use the built-in set class with no values. And speaking of dictionaries, that's actually what we're going to cover in our next video. But I hope everyone feels comfortable now with working with lists and tuples and sets. But if anyone does have any questions about what we covered in this video, then feel free. Hey there, how's it going everybody? In this video, we'll be learning about dictionaries and how we can work with them in Python. So dictionaries allow us to work with key value pairs. And if you're coming from another programming language, then you may have heard these called hash maps or associative arrays. So when I say that we'll be working with key value pairs, these are two linked values where the key is a unique identifier where we can find our data and the value is that data. So we can actually think of that almost like a real physical dictionary where we look up word definitions. So in that example, each word that we look up would be the key, and the definition of that word would be the value. So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples. So let's say that we wanted to represent a student using a dictionary. So to do this, we could just create a student variable and set this equal to these curly braces, and that's how we start our dictionary. Now within our curly braces here, we will first put in our key. So let's say that we want a, a key of name. Now we're going to put in a colon to separate our key from our value. And for the name here, we'll just start off with John. And now let's add some more keys and values. And to separate these keys and values, we're going to put in a comma. So next, let's put in a key of age and a value of 25. And lastly, we'll put in a key of courses. And for this value, we'll pass in a list of courses here. So we'll say math and comp sci. So now let's print out our student and see how that looks. So if we save that and run it, then we can see that it prints out all of our keys and values. Now, let's just get a value of one key. So to do this, we can add square brackets after our dictionary and then specify the key that we want to access. So I can put in square brackets here, and let's say that we want to access the name of that student dictionary. So I'll just pass in the name key and run that. And we can see that that gave us that value of that name key. Now, if I wanted the courses instead, then I could just pass in uh, that courses for the key. If I run that, then you can see that we got this list of math and comp sci. So we can see that these values in our dictionary can be just about anything. Our name is a string, our age is an integer, and the courses are a list. Now, all of our keys are currently strings, but they can actually be any immutable data type. So usually these will either be strings or integers, but there are a few more data types that they can be as well. So for example, instead of name as our key here, if for some reason we wanted this to be an integer, so I'll just pass in one, so a one is a valid key. And now if I access that key of one and run that, then you can see that that gave us John. But uh, I'm gonna set that back to be a string for now and keep that as name. So what happens if we try to access a key that doesn't exist? So for example, I'll try to access the key of phone for a phone number. So if we run this, then we can see that we get a key error because that phone key doesn't exist. Now, throwing an error when a key doesn't exist might not always be what we want. So sometimes we might just want to return none or a default value. So to do this, we can use the dictionary's get method. So instead of accessing this key 
this way. If we were instead to say dot get and use the get method. Um, so let's just go ahead and get the name since we know that that key already exists. So if I run that, then we can see that that works just like before and gave us the value of John. But if I try to access a key that doesn't exist, so we'll try to access that phone key again. If I save that and run it, then by default, this get method returns none instead of an error. And we can also specify a default value for keys that don't exist. So to do this, we can just pass the default value that we want as a second argument to this get method. So I'll just put in a comma here and we'll put in a string that just says not found. So if I save that and run it, now we can see that for keys that don't exist, it returns not found. Um, okay, so let's look at how we can add a new entry to our dictionary. So let's say that we wanted to add that phone number to our student dictionary, and we'll set this just above our print statement here. So to do this, it's just as easy as saying student, and then we will set the key that we want to set and set this equal to, and we'll just set this equal to a string of 555-5555. And if I save that and run it, then we can see that it found that value of the phone key when we ran our print statement. Now, if a key already exists, if we set its value like this, then it will update the value of that key. So for example, if right below this, I was to say student and name is equal to, and we'll just pass in Jane. If I save that and then print out, I'll comment out that for now. If I print out our entire student variable, then we can see down here that the value for name was updated when we assigned it to Jane. Now we can also update values using the update method. Now this is especially useful when we want to update multiple values at a time. So for example, let's say that we wanted to add this phone number, uh, update this name, and also update the age as well. So to do this all in one shot, we could say student.update, and this takes in a dictionary as an argument. And the dictionary is just everything that we either want to add or update. So we can say that we want to update that name to Jane, and we will update the age to, let's say, 26. And we also want to add this phone key. And that phone key will just set as what we had before, 555, 5555. Now, if I save that and run it, then we can see that just by running this one statement, we updated the name to Jane. The age is now 26, and it has this new key of phone number. Okay, so now let's say that we wanted to delete a specific key and its value. Now, one way that we can do this is by using the del keyword, which stands for delete. So let me just remove these updates here. And then we can say, so let's say that we wanted to delete the student's age. So it's as easy as just saying del student age. And now if we run this, then we can see that now the only keys that exist are name and courses. So that age key was deleted. Now another way that we can remove a key and value is with the pop method. So if you remember from our video on lists, the pop method will remove but also return that value. So that allows us to grab the removed value with a variable. So we could say um, age is equal to and do a student.pop and what we want to pop is that age. So if I save that then we'll also print the age here below student. If I run that, then we can see that the age and value were removed from our dictionary, but we also created that age variable that contained the value that we popped off. So that popped off 25. Okay, now let's look at how we can loop through all the keys and values of our dictionary. So first, if we want to see how many keys we have in our dictionary, then we can just print out its length with the len function. So if I was to say print, len of student and run that, then we can see that it returns three because we have three keys in our student dictionary. Now, if we wanted to see all of these keys, then we could just print out student.keys. If I run that, then we can see that that gave us all of the keys of our dictionary. If we wanted all of our values, then we could print out student.values. If I run that, you can see that that gives us only the values. Now, if we wanted to see the keys and values, then we could use this items method. If I run this, then we can see that now we have these pairs of key and value pairs. So we have name John, age 25, courses with the list. 
and we'll be coming back to these pairs in just one second. So if we wanted to loop through all of the keys and values in our dictionary, we might be tempted to loop through the same way we loop through our list. But if we just loop through our list without using any method, then it'll just loop through the keys. So for example, if you were to say for key in student and then print out that key, if we run this, then we can see that it just looped through and printed out all of those keys. Now, in order to loop through the keys and values, we'll need to use that items method that we just saw a second ago. And so we'll just plug that in there. We'll say student.items. And now these come in a pair of two values. So instead of just key, we're also going to have to access the value. So we can say for key value in student.items. And now we'll print out the key and that value. So if I run that, so we can see that each loop through, this key variable was equal to each key, and this value variable was equal to each value. Okay, so I think that's going to do it for this video. I hope that now everyone feels comfortable working with dictionaries and the functionality that's available to us. And in the next video, we'll be going over conditionals and how to write if, else, and elif statements. We'll also be learning more about Booleans and Boolean operators. Now, if anyone has any questions about what we covered in this video, hey there, how's it going, everybody? In this video, we'll be learning about conditionals and how we can control what statements get executed depending on whether certain values evaluate to true or false. And we've mentioned in previous videos that these true and false values are called Booleans. So let's look at one of the simplest conditionals that we can write. So we're going to write an if statement and we'll say if, and now the condition that we want to check whether it evaluates to true or false. So we're just going to make this obvious for now and just say true, then we'll put in a colon and hit enter. And now in the next line, we want to be sure that we're indented over so that we're writing code within our if block. So now we'll just print out a string here and I'll just say conditional was true. So now if I save that and run it, then we can see that it printed out that our condition was true. Now this print statement will only be executed if the condition after our if statement evaluates to true. So what if I was to instead change this over to false? Now if I run this, then we can see that it didn't print out the statement within our if block. Now conditionals are usually not hard coded to true and false values like this. We really want to put in some code that evaluates to true or false. So for example, I'm going to create a variable here and I'll just call this variable language and I'll set this equal to Python. So now let's say that we only want to execute this print statement if the language is equal to Python. So to do this, we can say if language equals equals Python. Now notice that we have a double equals here. So this tests for equality. Now this is different from the single equal sign, which is for assigning values. So with this double equals here, we're testing for equality. And this will evaluate to true or false. And that will determine if the code in our if statement is executed. So if we run this, then we can see that it executed our print statement that the condition was true. Now there are a lot of different comparisons that we can test for, and I've got these written out in a snippets file here. So I'm just going to copy these and paste them in so that we have them as a reference. Now we went over some of these in our numbers tutorial, but let's go ahead and just look through here really quick. So double equals test for equality, exclamation point equals test if something is not equal, Greater than sign is for greater than, less than sign is for less than, greater than equal to is for greater than or equal to, less than equal to is for less or equal. And then we have this uh, object identity. Now some people wonder what the difference is between this and the double equal signs, but when we use this is keyword check, we're actually checking if values have the same ID or basically whether they're the same object in memory. And we're going to look at an example of this in just a bit, but right now let's move on to else statements. So what if we wanted to execute one portion of our code if our language was equal to Python, but another portion of our code if it wasn't? So to do this, we're going to use an else statement. So first, I'm going to change my print statement here and just print this to say that the language is Python. And now we want to execute some code if the language is not equal to Python. So to do this, we're just going to put in an else statement. And make sure that your else is back here on our baseline and not within our if statement. So now we'll say else. And now within our else block, we will print out a string that just says no match. So now if we run this, we can see that it printed out 
that the language is Python. So our check if the language is equal to Python is evaluating to true. So it's printing the code within that block. And since it meets that conditional, it never executes the code within our else block. Now, if I was instead to change this language and set that equal to Java and rerun this, then we can see that it didn't meet the conditional for our if statement, so that evaluated to false. So then it dropped down to our else statement and executed that code. Okay, so what if we wanted to check for multiple languages and execute different code for each one that we encountered? So this is where an elif statement comes in. So let's say that we wanted to check if the language was equal to Python, and if it wasn't, then we wanted to check if it was equal to Java, and if it was neither of those, then we would just print out no match. So we'll add our additional check after our if statement by putting in an elif and again, make sure that your indentation is back to this base level because we're no longer in the if block. So now I'm just going to copy this code here and say if the language is equal to Java and put in our colon and then we'll grab this and just say print language is Java. So basically what this is saying is if the language is equal to Python, then execute this code. If it's not, then run a second conditional and see if it's equal to Java. And if it is, then run this code. And if none of those conditionals are met, then print no match. So now if we run this, then we can see that it executed the print statement that the language is Java and none of these other statements were executed. Now, if you're coming from another language, you might be wondering if Python has a switch case statement. Now, if you don't know what a switch case statement is, then it's not a big deal. Basically, it's just a way to check multiple values. And Python doesn't have a switch case. And the reason is because the if, elif, and else statements are plenty clean enough to do this already. So if we wanted to check another language, then we could just keep adding elif statements. So if I wanted to add a JavaScript check to the list, then I could just come down here. If I copy all of this, then I could just do another test here for JavaScript and then say, if the language is JavaScript, then execute this code here. And this basically gives us the same functionality as a switch case from another language. Okay, so now I'm going to remove some code here so that we can take a look at another example. Now, in addition to these comparisons that we have here, we also have some Boolean operations that we can use. And these are and, or, and not. So for example, let me create two variables here and I'll call one of these user and set this equal to a string of admin. And then I'll create a, another variable here called logged in and I'll set that equal to true. Now let's say that we only wanted to execute some code if the user is equal to admin and logged in is equal to true. Now to do this, we can use the and keyword. So I could say if user equal equals admin, and then we'll use this and keyword and logged in. And now we can run the code uh, if this is true. So I'll just print out a string that says admin page. And now we can put in an else block and then for the else block, I'll just say, if neither of these are true, then print out the string that just says uh, bad creds for credentials. And let me bring this down just a little bit here. And just to give us a little bit of extra room, I'm actually going to delete uh, these comparison comments up here that we have as a reference, but I will have a link to these uh, to the GitHub page so that you can download those if you want to have those as a reference. Okay, so now if we run the code that we currently have, then we can see that it printed out our admin page because both of those evaluated to true. Our user is equal to admin and our logged in is equal to true. But if I changed our logged in variable to false and rerun this, then we can see that it executes our bad credentials statement because both of these didn't evaluate to true. So this user equals admin evaluated to true but logged in was equal to false. So and make sure that both of these have to be true. Now, if we only care if one of these evaluate to the true, then we can use the or keyword. So I could change this and to an or. And now if I run this, then you can see that it printed out our admin page statement because that evaluated to true because only one or the other needed to be true. And our user was equal to admin, so it didn't matter if the logged in was false or not, because it only had to be one or the other. 
Now this not operation is just used to switch a boolean. So it'll change a true to a false and a false to a true. So for example, if we were to say if not logged in, then we will print a string here that just says uh, please log in and else print welcome. So we can see that currently our logged in value is equal to false. Now when we say not logged in, then it will evaluate to true because this not just switches that false to a true. Now I know that that can sound a little confusing, but basically you can just think of it as saying not false, if not false, which would evaluate to true. So if we run this, then it prints out please log in because not logged in evaluated to true, so it ran what was in our if statement. So when I had the conditionals pulled up here as a reference before, so now I'm in my snippets here, we remember that we had this object identity with this is keyword, and I said that we'd look at the difference between that and the double equals which tests for equality. Now like I said before, that object identity um, Test if two objects have the same ID, which basically means if they're the same object in memory. So two objects can actually be equal and not be the same object in memory. So for example, let me create two different lists here. So I'll just call one list equal to A, and I'll put in the values of one, two, three. Another list equal to B, and put in the values one, two, three. And now I will print out A double equals B. So this should evaluate to true because these two lists are equal. So if we run this, then we can see that we got true, which is what we would expect because A and B are equal. But instead, if we say A is B, and then we run this, then that returns false. Now the reason is because these are two different objects in memory, and we can print out these locations with this built-in ID function. So right above printing that uh, A is B, I'm also going to print out the ID of A, and I will also print out the ID of B. So I'll save that and run it. And we can see that these IDs are different. So really, this is comparison is really checking whether these IDs are the same. So up here, instead of creating a new list, if I just said B equals A and save that and run it, now we can see that the ID of A and the ID of B are the same. And then when we print A is B, that evaluates to true because now these are the same object in memory. And if I check equality, then they're also equal. So that's basically the difference there. Behind the scenes, the is comparison, if you say A is B, it's really the same as saying ID of A equals equals the ID of B. So if I run that, that's equal to true. That's basically what the is operator does. Okay, so basically, all the conditionals that we looked at uh, completely depend on what Python evaluates to true or false. So let's see what all Python evaluates to true or false. And there are a few things that may be unexpected to us. So I have a couple of things pulled up here in my snippets, and let me grab these really fast. So to determine what Python evaluates to true and false, it's easier to show everything that evaluates to false, and then everything else will by default evaluate to true. And we have a quick if-else statement here to test all of these. So we're gonna make a few different conditions here, and if that condition evaluates to true, we'll print out evaluated to true, else evaluated to false. And my comments here are all the things in Python that evaluate to false values. So the first one is the most obvious. If we set a conditional equal to false, then it's going to evaluate to false. And this one would include all the comparison operations that we just saw. So they would return true or false. So if I run this, then we can see that obviously our conditional evaluated to false here since we set our condition equal to false. Now the next value in our list here is none. So none actually evaluates to false as well. So if we put that value in as our conditional and run this, then we can see that with our condition equal to none, that that condition also evaluates to false. Now this next one here isn't always so obvious. So if you have a numeric data type and pass it into a conditional, then zero will evaluate to false. So if we set this condition equal to zero and run this, 
then we can see that that evaluated to false. But if we set this to any other number, so if our condition is 10 instead of zero and run that, then we can see that that evaluated to true. So that's something to keep in mind there when working with numbers because you don't want to accidentally pass in a zero that you think would be true, but it evaluates to false. Okay, so moving on down the list, if we have any empty sequence and pass it into a conditional, then that will evaluate to false. So this can be an empty string, an empty list, an empty tuple. Um, so for example, if I just set this condition to an empty list and run this, then we can see that that evaluates to false. And if you have an empty string, that evaluates to false also. And now lastly here in our list, uh, empty mapping. So an empty mapping, which is basically an empty dictionary, this evaluates to false as well. So if I pass in an empty dictionary here and run this, then we can see that that empty dictionary also evaluated to false. Now, knowing these types of things can be useful because let's say that you have a function or something that is supposed to return some values. Now, sometimes it's needed to check if those values are actually there. So you could just pass in these sequences into a conditional to check whether a string is empty or a dictionary is empty. And you don't actually have to call any specific method. You can just pass in the empty sequence or the empty dictionary and it'll evaluate the true or false if that is empty. Now, there are also some user-defined classes that can evaluate to false, but these are the majority of the conditions that we'll be checking. So now that we know everything that evaluates to false, then everything else is obviously going to evaluate to true. So, you know, for example, just to uh, do another example here, if I set this condition equal to a string that just says test, now an empty string would evaluate the false. So if we pass that in, then we can see that, that a string with some characters evaluated to true. So that's really important when working with these conditionals is just having an idea of what is going to evaluate to true and what's going to evaluate to false. Okay, so I think that is gonna do it. Hey there, how's it going everybody? In this video, we'll be learning about loops and iterations. Specifically, we'll be going over for loops and while loops. Now, we've seen loops a couple of times in our previous videos when looping through strings or lists, but there's some more functionality that we haven't gone over yet uh, that we'll see in this video. But first, let's just do a quick recap. So we've got a list of numbers here with numbers one through five. So let's loop through this list. So to do this, we're gonna use a for loop. So we'll say for num in nums. And within here, I'm just going to print out that num. So what we're saying here is that we want to create a loop where we're looping through each value of our list. And each time through the loop, this num variable will be equal to the next item in the list. So the first time through, it'll be equal to one. The next time through, it'll be equal to two and so on. So if we run this, we can see that it looped through and printed each number of our list. So now let's look at two important keywords when working with loops. And these are the break and continue keywords. So the break keyword will completely break out of a loop and the continue keyword moves on to the next iteration of the loop. So first let's look at the break statement. So let's say that we are looking for a certain number in our list. And once we find it, we don't need to continue looping through the rest of our values. Now this is when the break statement comes in handy. So let's say that we're looking for the value of three. So I could come in here to our list and I could say if num equals equals three, then within this uh, conditional, we'll print out that we found it and then we will break out of that loop. So now let's go ahead and run this. So we can see that it looped through the numbers one and two, but it didn't hit this conditional when the num equaled one and the num equaled two. And since those first two values didn't meet this conditional, then it didn't print out found and it didn't break out of the loop. But when it got to number three, it did meet this conditional. So it printed out found and then our break statement broke out of the for loop. And when it broke out of the for loop, you can see that we didn't iterate through any more values. So we did not get through to values four or values five. Now notice that we broke out of our loop before we printed the number. So the three never got printed out. But if our print statement were above this conditional, then the three would have been printed out. So the break statement breaks out of the loop. But what if we wanted to just ignore a value 
but not break out of the loop completely. So to do this, we can use the continue statement. Now continue will skip to the next iteration of a loop. So if we replace this break statement with continue uh, and run this, so we can see here that just like before, the first two times through with one and two, it didn't meet this conditional, so it didn't do anything within this if block, and it just printed out our number. But when we got to the number three, it did meet this conditional, and it came in here and printed out found, and then our continue statement just skipped to the next iteration without coming out here and printing out the number three. So as soon as we hit continue, then it just went to the next iteration, which was four and five. So when four and five ran through, they didn't meet these conditionals and it just printed out the number. So it's important to understand the break and continue statements and the differences between those because there's a lot of different use cases for when they come in handy to solve certain problems. Okay, so now let's look at something that we might run into, which is a loop within a loop, and this is possible. So within our loop here, I'm going to replace this conditional with an inner loop. So now I'll say for letter n, and I'll just uh, make a string here of abc. Now within this inner loop, then I'll just go ahead and print out num, comma, and the letter. So now what's going to happen here is that for each number, it'll loop through every character in this string and print out the number and the character and then move on to the next number and do it all over again. So let's run this and see what we get. So now let me make this just a little bit larger here. So now we can see that what happened is that for one, it looped through every letter in the string and then after it finished that inner loop, then it moved on to the next number before doing the exact same thing. So we have 1a, 1b, 1c, then it moved on to 2, 2a, 2b, 2c, and so on. So what this really did is it gave us every combination of those numbers and characters. Now you want to be careful with nested lists because these combinations can grow pretty quickly. So if you have nested loops with a lot of different values, then it may take a while to loop through all of those different combinations. Okay, so something that we'll probably run into a lot is that there's going to be times when we just want to go through a loop a certain number of times. And there's a built-in function called range that is really useful for this. So let's say that we wanted to just run through a loop 10 times. So to do this, we can just say for i in range 10. And within here, we will just print out i. So now if we run this, then we can see that it just prints out zero through nine, which is 10 items. So we start at zero and go up to, but not including this number that we passed into range. Now, if we don't want to start at zero, then we can also pass a starting value into range. So if we wanted to start at one and print out the, the, the values one through 10, then what we could do is say that we want to start at one and now we're going to have to go up to 11 because it doesn't include the last value. So now if we run this, then we can see that now it started at 1 and goes up to but not including 11. So 1 through 10. Okay, so now let's take a look at while loops. So our for loops iterated through a certain number of values, but while loops will just keep going into a, until a certain condition is met or until we hit a break. So for example, let's say that we had a variable here of x equal to zero, and now we can say that while that x is less than 10, then what we want to do is just print out x, and then we will iterate x by one. Now we have to remember that this loop is going to go on forever until this condition here evaluates to false. So if we want this loop to end at some point, then we have to remember to increment this x so that at some point it will be greater than or equal to 10 so that it breaks out. So now if we run this, then we can see that it prints out zero through nine. So it came in and saw that x was zero, which is less than 10. So it goes through the loop, prints the value, and increments x by one. Now x is equal to one, and it does this check again. So one is still less than 10, so it stays in the loop. And it does this until we increment x from nine to 10, and then it'll come in here and make that check. And it checks if 10 is less than 10, which it doesn't, um, which evaluates to false. So it breaks out of that loop. 
Now at any point you can just use a break to break out of the while loop just like we did with the for loop. So if I came in here and I said if x is equal to 5 then we just want to break out. So if we run that then we can see that it went 0 through 4 and once x was equal to 5 then we hit that break statement. Now sometimes you'll just want to create an infinite loop that never ends until we get some input or find some value. Now to create an infinite loop, you can just replace the comparison that we're doing here with a value of true. So now that we have an infinite loop, there's no conditional here that can break out. So now we have to have this break statement in here if we ever want to stop this loop. So if we run this, then we can see that we get the uh, same output there. Now in this example, we're using a conditional, but this is also how you would keep a loop going indefinitely until you find or receive values that you're looking for. Now, if you ever accidentally get stuck in an infinite loop, then within most environments or operating systems, you can interrupt that by pressing Control C to stop the process. So if we comment out our conditional here with the break statement, then this is going to get stuck in an infinite loop and just go on forever. So now if we run this code, then we can see that we get stuck in this infinite loop where it just keeps incrementing x by 1 and printing out x. Now to get out of this on most operating systems, you can press control C and it'll interrupt that. So I press control C and you can see that it was canceled. And if you are in your terminal or command prompt, then console, uh, control C should send a keyboard interrupt. Okay, so I think that is going to do it for this video. I hope that now you have a clear understanding of the different loops and how the break and continue statements work. In the next video, we'll be learning how to write functions. But if anyone has any questions about what we covered in this video, then feel free. Hey there, how's it going everybody? In this video, we'll be learning about functions. Now functions are basically some instructions packaged together that perform a specific task. So let's create our first function and see why these are so beneficial. Now to create a function, we'll use the def keyword, which I believe stands for definition. And let's just make a simple function here to get started. I'll call this hello func. Now we have parentheses there because that is where our parameters will go when we add those in, but we don't have any parameters just yet, so that will be empty for now. Now it is possible to write a function and not have any code in it, but we can't leave it completely blank. Uh, but if we want to fill this function in later, then we can use this pass keyword. And basically that pass keyword is saying that we don't want to do anything with this for now, but it won't throw any errors for leaving it blank. So if we want to run our function, then we can just say hello underscore func and put in these parentheses. And we need to add those parentheses after the function in order to execute it. If we don't have those parentheses there, then it'll be equal to the function itself. Um, so let's actually see what that looks like. So I'm going to print out that hello function without the parentheses in place, uh, which means that we're not executing the function. So let me run that. And we can see when we printed that out, that it prints out that this is a function in a certain location in memory, but it didn't execute the function. So to execute it, then we add in these parentheses. So now if I run this, then now it just gives us none because we're not doing anything with this function yet and it doesn't have a return value. So let's go ahead and put some code into our function. So first we'll just put in a print statement and we'll just print out some text that says hello function with an exclamation point. And now that we're actually running that print statement from within the function, we don't need to print out that executed function. We can just execute that function and it should run that print statement. So we'll run that. So we can see that we executed our function here. It came within our function and ran our print statement. Now one benefit of functions is that they allow us to reuse code without repeating ourselves. So let's say for example that we had to print out some text in several locations throughout our program. So it might look something like this. So let me copy this and I'll comment out our uh, function execution for now. And I'm just going to paste this in about four times. So now if we run this, then as we expect, it prints out our four messages. Now imagine our boss came to us and told us that uh, the text was a little bit off and that we didn't want to have an exclamation point at the end of the string. Well, the way that we have it now, we'd have to come in here and change all of those manually. So I'd come in and change all of these man uh, messages to have a period instead. 
Now that was only four changes to make there, but in some instances that can be in hundreds of locations in multiple different files. So that's the first benefit of functions. It allows us to put code with a specific purpose into a single location. So instead of printing those four statements, uh, what we can instead do is run our function four times. So I will remove that and uncomment our function and we're going to execute this four different times. So now if we run that, then we can see that it ran our function four times and executed our print statement four different times. But now if our boss came to us and asked us to remove that exclamation point, then it doesn't matter if this is spread out over a hundred different lines or a hundred different locations. We can just update it in this one spot. So I can change this to a period. And now if we run this, then we can see that those changes are seen everywhere that the function is called. Now this is called keeping your code dry, which stands for don't repeat yourself. It's a common mistake for people new to programming to repeat the same things throughout their code when really they could either put their code into certain variables or functions so that it's in a single location. So we saw earlier that since we aren't returning anything from our function, uh, it was actually equal to none. So what does it mean for uh, our function to return something? Now this is where functions become really powerful because it allows us to operate on some data and then pass the result to whatever called our function. So instead of printing the string hello function within here, let's instead return this. Okay, so what does this mean exactly? This means that when we execute our function, it's actually gonna be equal to our return value. So these executed functions here are actually equal to the string hello function. So right now, if we run this, then it doesn't give us any results because it's just a string that we're not doing anything with. But if instead we print this, so let me print that executed function. And if we run that, then we can see that it prints out our string. So basically think of a function as a machine that takes input and produces a result. When you execute a function, you can think of it almost like a black box. You don't need to know exactly how it's doing what it's doing. You're mainly concerned about the input and the return value. So in this simple example here, we don't have any input and we can see that the return value is a string. Um, now, don't get me wrong, it's useful to know what a function is doing, but when you're first getting started, don't get caught up on understanding every detail of what every function does. Just focus on the input and what's returned. So for example, when we call the len function on a string, so if I print out len of this string test, if I run this, then as we saw in a previous video, this just returns an integer that is the number of characters in our string. So we have no idea what the code that produces that result looks like, but we do know that we passed in a string and that it returned this integer. And we'll see why here in a bit, why looking at functions in this way will help you become better when working with Python because we can treat the return value just like the data type that it is. And understanding this will allow you to chain together some functionality. So we know our hello function returns a string. So we can treat that executed function just like a string. So if we remember back to our string methods, remember that we can uppercase a string with dot upper. So really we can take this executed function and just chain dot upper onto the end of it. So now if we run this, now we can see that our executed function returned the string hello function. And then we were able to use the string method upper on that returned value to uppercase the string. Um, okay, so now let's look at how we can pass arguments to our function. And real quick, I'm going to remove that dot upper method. So to be able to pass arguments to our function, we'll need to create some parameters here within our parentheses. So let's say that we wanted to customize the greeting that our function returns. So let's create a, uh, a parameter called greeting. And now within our function, we'll return a string where we use that greeting instead of our uh, hello text that we had before. So now I'll just pass this in with a dot format. So now before we run this, we have to pass in that greeting argument when we execute our function. If we don't, then we'll get an error. So actually, let's go ahead and run this and see this error. So we can see that when we ran that, it says that hello func is missing one required positional argument, greeting. 
So let's pass in that greeting argument to our hello function. And to do that, we can just pass it in directly here uh, when we call our function. So I'm just going to pass in uh, hi as our string. So now if we run this, then we can see that when we passed in that string hi into our function, that it set that greeting variable equal to the string hi, and then returned the string hi function. Now this greeting variable doesn't affect any variables outside of the function. Its scope is only local to the function, which is nice because we don't have to worry about it affecting anything we don't want it to affect. So, and if you want to learn more about Python scope, then I do have a detailed video going in depth as to how that works exactly. And I'll leave a link to that video in the description section below. Okay, so right now this greeting parameter is a required argument, and that is because it doesn't have a default value. Now if we had a default value, then it would just fall back to the default value whenever we didn't pass that argument in. So let's see an example of this. So let's say that we also want to be able to pass a name to our hello function, and it will return a greeting and the name. So we can add that to our parameters by putting in a comma here and saying that we also want to accept this name parameter. But let's say that if no name is passed in, then we want to have a default value of u. So we can just say name is equal to u. And now let's add that to our return string. So I'll put in a comma, space, and then another placeholder, and we'll pass in that name. So what this is going to do is it will return a greeting and a name separated by a comma and a space. So if we run this, then we can see that even though we didn't pass in a value for the name argument when we executed this function, it didn't throw an error and instead use the default value that we specified as u. But if we want to pass in a value, then it will use that value instead. So when we execute this function, if I was to say name is equal to, and we'll say Corey and run that, then now we can see that it printed out the greeting with the name that we passed in. Um, now your required positional arguments have to come before your keyword arguments. Now if you try to create a function with those out of order, then it's gonna give you an error. Now this is a little more advanced topic that trips a lot of people up, but at some point you'll probably run across a function in Python uh, that looks something like this. So I'll say def student info, and you might see something where you see this star args and star star quarks. And so let me just go ahead and within this new function here, I will print out args and I'll also print out quarks. So let's not really worry about this function name for now. It's the arguments that I want to focus on. So seeing this star args and star star quarks can seem confusing at first, but basically all it's doing is allowing us to accept an arbitrary number of positional or keyword arguments. So for example, let's say that this student info function takes positional arguments that represent the classes that the student is taking plus the keyword arguments passed in will be random information about the student. So you can see in both of those examples, we don't know how many of these positional or keyword arguments there will be. And that's why we use star args and star star quarks. And the names don't have to be args and quarks, but that's a convention that you'll see a lot. So it's always good to stick with conventions so that people can understand your code. So let's call this function with some random values. So I'm gonna say student info. And first we want to pass in some positional arguments of the classes that they're taking. So we'll say math and art. And now for our keyword arguments, we'll pass in some random information about the student. So we'll say name is equal to John and age is equal to 22. So now if we run this, then we can see that when we printed the args, it's actually a tuple with all of our positional arguments and our quarks are a dictionary with all of our keyword values. So once you have that tuple and that dictionary, then you'll be able to do whatever you want with that information. Now, sometimes you might see a function call with arguments using the star or double star. Now, when it's used in that context, it will actually unpack a sequence or dictionary and pass those values into the function individually. So to see what I mean, let's make a list and a dictionary of everything that we just passed into our function. 
And just to clear up some room here, I'm gonna go ahead and delete the hello function that we started off with. So now I'm going to create a list called courses, and I'm gonna set this equal to math and art that we passed in before. And instead of a tuple, I'm gonna make that a list. So now for the student info, I'm gonna create a dictionary called info and set that equal to those values. So now let me get rid of our positional and keyword arguments here. So let's say that we wanted to pass all of these courses in as our positional arguments and the info dictionary as our keyword arguments. So if we just pass these in as is, and I passed in courses and info, now if we run this, then we can see that this might not be exactly what we thought. Instead of passing the values in individually, and instead passed in the complete list and the complete dictionary as positional arguments. So if we use the single star in front of our list and the double star in front of our dictionary, then it will actually unpack these values and pass them in individually. So basically it will be the equivalent to our previous execution uh, where we pass them in individually. So to see what I mean, let's add a star in front of this courses to unpack those values and a star star in front of our dictionary to unpack those keyword values. So now if we run this, then we can see that we got what we had before. Uh, we can see that when our function prints args, it's the values from our list that we unpacked and our quargs is equal to the dictionary values that we unpacked. Now, I know that's a little confusing, especially to, you know, get the idea that whenever you're passing these in, that it unpacks the values. And within here, it's for accepting an arbitrary number of positional or keyword values. But uh, it's a little more advanced of a topic, and I know it's confusing, but hopefully it makes some sense, and you'll be able to better understand what's going on if you ever run into something like that. Okay, so lastly, I wanted to run through an example that ties together everything we've learned so far in this series of videos. So I have some code here in my snippets file that I'm going to grab real quick and paste into the file that we've been working with. So now let me lower this output a little bit so that we can see everything here. Now these are actually a couple of functions that I grabbed from the Python standard library. I modified them very slightly, but it's basically the same. And I wanted to show that even though we've only gone over the fundamentals, we're already able to look at some code from within the standard library itself and understand what's going on. So at the top here, we have a list called month days, and this has the number of days in each month. Now the first index here is just a placeholder that's not gonna get used. Um, we're only gonna be accessing indexes one through 12 since our, those are the months. And then we have a function here called isLeap, which determines if a year is a leap year. It takes a single argument, that is the year that it's checking, and we can see that there's this string um, after the function definition with three quotes. And this is called a doc string. And doc strings help document what a function or a class is supposed to do. So it's a good practice anytime you write a function to write a doc string that goes along with it, explaining what that function is supposed to do. Now this part here can seem a little intimidating, but it's not important that you understand how a leap year is calculated. There's not a lot of people who know that off the top of their head, um, but for various reasons, this is how a leap year is calculated, and it's not important, but you could probably figure out what this uh, conditional is doing. So we're saying that if the year is divisible by four and uh, it's not divisible by 100 or it's divisible by 400, so like I was saying, there's a lot of different reasons why uh, leap years are determined this way. And if you don't know that, that's completely fine. But this function here is going to return true if a year is a leap year and false if it's a non-leap year. And down here, we have a days and month function that takes a year and a month as arguments, and it'll return the number of days in that month. So if we look at how this function works, we can see that it first checks if a month is between 1 and 12. And if it's not, then it returns that it's an invalid month. And then it checks if the month that we're working with is the second month, which would mean that it's February, and is a leap year using our function up here at the top, then it returns 29 if both of those are true. And lastly, if it makes it to the end without having returned anything yet, then it will index into our month days and list up here at the top and return the value of our month. 
So let's just run through this one time and see how these functions work. So outside of both of the functions, we're going to go ahead and first use this is leap year function. So we'll say is leap 2017. So if we run this, then it returns false. So we ran this function is leap passed in 2017 as our value, and it went through this complicated conditional here and determined that that was false. But if we type in 2020 here and run that, then we can see that it returns true that 2020 is a leap year. But now let's try our days and month function, which is going to be a little bit longer of a walkthrough. So we'll say days and month, and we'll pass in a year so it takes a year first we'll pass in a year of 2017 and we'll pass in a month of two which is february now since 2017 is not a leap year then this second month which is february should only have 28 days so if we run this then we can see that we got 28. so let's walk through exactly what happened just so we're sure that we understand so we executed our days and month function with our arguments of 2017 for the year and two for the month. So it comes in uh, to our days and month function and it sets this year variable equal to 2017 and this month variable equal to two. So let's comment those here just to keep track of them through our walkthrough. So I'll put a comment for year as 2017 and a comment for month as two. So first it checks if our month is not between 1 and 12. Our month is 2, so it is in that range. So it doesn't meet this conditional. And since it doesn't meet that conditional, then we just continue on. So our next conditional asks if the month is equal to 2 and is a leap year. So our month is equal to 2, but this is leap function runs through its code with the year 2017 and returns false. So since is leap is false and we're using an and operator, then the whole conditional evaluates to false. So we move on. And lastly, it accesses the month days list at this month index. And remember that our month is equal to two. So it's accessing the second index. And if we look up here to our month days list and go to our second index, so zero, one, two, then we can see that that's equal to 28. So it should be returning 28 here. And finally, when we printed out that result, 28 is what we got as our result. Now, I know that it was kind of a long walkthrough, but I thought it might be useful to see how these things actually work together and how do you go about determining what a function should return based on the arguments that you pass in. Okay, so I think that is, hey there, how's it going everybody? In this video, we'll be learning how to import modules. We'll start by importing modules that we've written, and then we'll explore a bit of the standard library and how we can import those modules to solve a lot of common problems. So I have a module here called mymodule.py. Now within this module, we have a print statement, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. We also have this test variable set to test string, and then we have this function called find index. And this find index function takes in two arguments. It takes in a list to search and a target that we're looking for. And we can see that we have some documentation here that just says that this finds the index of a value in a sequence, um, and then it returns that index. But if it doesn't find that value, then it just returns negative one. So let's say that we wrote this function and that we wanna use this in other modules or scripts. So what we're gonna to wanna to do is import this. So I have another module over here, uh, which is just our intro.py file that we've been working with. Now within this file, we have this courses variable that is just a list of course names. So let's say that we wanna use that find index function from my module. Now I actually created this my module in the same directory as my intro.py. So that means that we're going to be able to directly import that. Now when we import a file, it actually runs all of the code from the module that we import. So that's how it creates all of the functions and variables. But if we have any other code like print statements or anything like that, then that will be run as well. So that's why I have the print statement here in my module so that we can see when that happens. So to import this module, we can just come to the top of the file here and say import my module. And again, we can import that directly because it's in the same directory as our intro.py file. And now if we run this with this import, then we can see that it imported successfully because it printed out that print statement within that module. 
Okay, so let's say that we want to use that find index function. Now, when importing modules like this, we just can't call our find index function. We instead have to type the module name first, and then what we want to grab from that module. So if we wanted to use that, then we could say, let's say index is equal to my module dot find index and now we'll pass in the list that we want to search which is courses and now the target that we're looking for so we'll go ahead and say that we're looking for math and now let's print out that index and run that so now we can see that that works it returned one and one is the index of the math value Okay, so if we're using this find index function multiple times throughout our script, then it might get a little old and take up a lot of room to keep typing my module index everywhere. We can actually specify a name that we want to use for our imported module. And usually this is used to make the module name shorter. So for example, when we're importing my module here at the top, we could instead say import my module as mm or any other name that we come up with. And now when using this import throughout the script, instead of typing out my module everywhere, we can instead just use mm. So if I save that and run it, then we'll see that that still works. Now you'll see this a lot with modules like NumPy or Pandas. So you might see someone who does an import and they'll do import NumPy as NP or something like that. Now you might be wondering if there's a way that we can import the function itself and there is a way to do this. So instead we could say from my module import and then what we want to import from that module. So we want to import find index. So now when we use this throughout the code, now we can just use that find index function anywhere and that really cuts down on the typing. So now we can save that and run it and see that it still works. Now one thing to note about that approach is that it only gives us access to that find index function and not everything else in the module. So for example, you'll remember that we had this test variable equal to this test string. So when we do the import this way, now we don't have access to that test variable since we're only now importing the find index function. Now, if we wanted to import that variable, then we would have to include it by putting in a comma and then specifying what we want. So we want to say from my module, import find index, comma, and test. So now down below here, we can print out that test variable. And if we run that, and we can see that we do have access to that test variable now. Now when doing the import this way, we still have access to that as keyword. So if we wanted to make this even shorter hand, then we can say import find index as fi. And now throughout our code, we can replace that with fi and run that. You can see that it still works. Now at this point, that's not really readable anymore. So don't rename something like that unless it's still readable and makes sense to others who are reading your code. So now let's go ahead and just undo that change. Now using this method of importing, we'd have to add commas and specify each value that we want to import. Now there is a way to just import everything and I'll show you how to do this, but I have to be honest, I never use this and it's pretty frowned upon. Um, and we'll see why that is. But if we wanted to just import everything, then we could say from my module, import star. So if we run this, then we can see that everything still works. We still have access to this find index function and this test variable. But the reason that this is frowned upon is because now we can't tell what came from that imported module and what didn't. So if we're having problems with this find index function, then we might try to track down where that function came from or where it was defined. And with that asterisk, it's just not obvious that it came from that module that was imported. So instead, we'll go back to importing both of those directly. So basically importing everything with that asterisk just makes it harder to track down problems. So it's better to do it this way. Okay, so when we import a module, how does it know where to find this module? So we didn't pass in a file path or tell Python where to find this module, it just found it. So the way that this works is that when we import a module, it checks multiple locations. And the locations that it checks is within a list called sys.path. And we can actually see this list if we import the sys module. So I'll import sys, and now down here we'll comment out these two print statements. And now let's print out that sys.path and run that. 
So this is the list of directories on my machine where Python looks for modules when we run an import, and it looks in this order. Now, this first value here is just the directory where I'm currently running the script from. And the my module Python file that we were importing is within that directory also, so that's how it found it. Okay, so what directories are added to this sys.path list? So directories get added in this order. First, the directory containing the script that we're running. So that is why this directory where we're running the script is the first value in sys.path. So you can always import modules from the same directory. And next, it adds directories listed in the Python path environment variable. And we'll talk more about the Python path environment variable in just a minute. And then after the Python path, it then adds the standard library directories. And that's how we can import those modules from the standard library. And lastly, it adds the site packages direct directory for third party packages. And we'll look at all of these. So first, let's see what it looks like when the module that we want to import isn't in the same directory as the script that we're trying to import it from. So I'm gonna move the module that we've been importing from the same directory into a directory on our desktop. So I've got Finder pulled up here, and I'm just going to drag this My Module over here into this My Modules directory that is on my desktop. So now that module that we're trying to import is in a completely different location on our machine. So if we go back to here to our script and now try to run this, then we can see that we get this error, module not found, no module named my module. Now there are a couple of approaches that we can take here. First is that we can actually manually add that directory to our sys.path list. So this sys.path is a list just like any other that we've been looking at, and we can treat it like one. So before we try to import my module, we could add that directory to sys.path. So I'm going to import this here at the top before we try to import that module. And then I'll say sys.path.append and the location on my machine, this is probably going to be different on yours, but the location on mine is uh, users-cori-desktop-my-modules. And I believe I need a dash here at the beginning as well. So if I save that and run it, we can see that when we appended that directory to our sys.path, that we were now able to import that module and run our code. But this isn't the best looking approach because we're appending this directory before our other imports. And also, if we were to import our module and we had this manually hard-coded in multiple locations, then we'd have to change all of those. So instead, we can make this change in the next place sys.path looks. And if we remember, that is the Python path environment variable. Now changing the environment variables is different on Mac and Windows, so we'll show how to do this on both really quick. So first we'll see how to do this on a Mac. And to do this, I'm gonna pull up my terminal, and we can set environment variables by adding them to the dot bash underscore profile file in our home directory. And you can edit this file with any text editor, but I'm gonna use the one built into the terminal here called nano, since nano is easy for anyone to use. So we're gonna say nano, and then a tilde dash just makes sure that we're working within our home directory. Then we'll say dot bash underscore profile. Now I might have more stuff in this file than you do. These are just personal preferences and customizations, but I'm gonna scroll down here to the end of the file and set my Python path. But you can set this anywhere in this file that you'd like. So we're gonna set this by saying export Python path, all uppercase, and then equals, and now we want to set that location. So I'm just gonna come over here and grab that location and paste that in those quotes. And we want it to look just like that, no space in between the equals and the path. So to save that, we can just hit Control X and then Y to save and then enter to keep the same file name. And now we can either restart our terminal or run a source command on that file. But I'll just restart the terminal here and pull this up. And now if we run Python, then let's see if we can import that module. So import my module. And we can see that that worked. And the reason that that worked is because if we import sys and look at our sys.path, then we can see that after our current directory that we have the directory that was added there. And the reason that it's added is because we added it to our Python path environment variable. So now let's take a look at how to set this environment variable on Windows. 
Now to set this environment variable on Windows, we can click on our start button here and then right click on computer and go to properties. And from properties, we wanna to go to advanced system settings. And from here at the very bottom, we can click on environment variables. And now we can create a new environment variable. So we'll click new and we'll name this Python path, all uppercase there. And then for the location, that's gonna be C, we're gonna to go to the desktop again. So again, this is uh, specific to my desktop, but it may be a little bit different on yours. So Corey MS slash desktop, and then the name of that directory is my dash modules. And again, this Python path is gonna be unique to your own machine. So let's hit okay there and okay to save those and exit out of that. And now if we open up our command prompt by going to start run CMD and then typing in Python, and now we should be able to import that module just by saying import my module. And if we run that, and we can see that it imported that module successfully. Now the reason that worked is because if we import sys and look at our sys Dot path then after our current directory you can see that our directory that we added to our Python path is the second one that it looks at here so that is how we add that environment variable on Windows so now I'll switch back to my native OS now I do want to point out that if you're using an editor like sublime text or Eclipse or PyCharm then these may need to have their environment variables set in a different way and that's different for every program so instead of going through each individual one and showing how uh, you can likely find out how to do that just by searching for your editor plus Python path and there should be plenty of resources showing you how to do that. Okay so going back to this sys.path now, after the directories in the Python path environment variable that we just looked at, uh, after that, sys.path looks at the standard library directories. Now, this is what allows us to import modules directly from the standard library. So when something is part of the standard library, it means that we're able to use it without installing anything separately. So the standard library is incredibly useful because if you're performing a common task, then most likely someone has already written the functionality. And if we use it from the standard library, library, then we can be sure that it's been written by some of the best programmers in the world and has been optimized to be as performant as possible. Now that's not to say that you shouldn't try to write your own versions of some of these things uh, just to get some practice, but as far as using any of that functionality in production, it's probably a good idea to use the tried and true standard library. So for example, let's say that we wanted to grab a random value from a list of values. So you could probably write something to do this on your own, but that functionality is already available to us when we use the random module from the standard library. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So I'll get rid of everything here just to clean up, except for our courses list. Now this random module is just part of the standard library and we can just say import random. And if we wanted to grab a random value from our courses list, then we could just say random course is equal to random dot choice and then pass in our courses list. So now if we print out that random course and run that, then we can see it gave us a random value. And if we run this multiple times, then we can see that it gives us a random value just about every time we run through. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of the functionality in the standard library, but I will create a future video to go over some of these modules in depth. But right now, I just wanna give you an idea of what's available to us. So here are a few more useful standard library modules. So if we need to perform some common mathematical operations, then we can import the math module. And now we can do some mathematic calculations. So if we needed to convert 90 degrees into radians, then we could say rads is equal to math.radians and pass in 90. And then if we print rads and run that, then we can see that we get that conversion. And if we wanted to get the sine of that value, then we could pass those radians into the sine method. So I can say math.sine pass in those radians, and if I run that, then we can see that one is the sine of 90 degrees. Okay, and another useful module from the standard library is the date time module. Now this allows us to work with dates and times. And while we're at it, let's also go ahead and import the calendar module. Now these have some similarities, but they're also very different. So for example, if I wanted today's date, then we could just say today is equal to datetime.date.today, and if we print this out, 
and run that, then we can see that that gives us today's date. Now, with the calendar module, we can ask, for example, is 2017 a leap year? So I could print out and say calendar dot is leap and pass in 2017. If I run that, we can see that that's false. But if I instead change that to 2020 and run that, then you can see that that is true. And the last standard library module that we'll look at for now is the OS module. So I will import OS. Now this is going to give us access to the underlying operating system. So for example, if I wanted to see what directory we're currently in with this script, then I could print out os.getcwd, which is current working directory. So if we run that, then we can see that it prints out the current working directory where this script is located. Now this OS module has a ton of other functionality. It gives us the ability to scan the file system and create files, delete files, and all of that. So you can see how these standard library modules provide a ton of functionality that might be tricky or take forever for us to write ourselves. So Python comes with a ton of stuff available to us and makes it super easy to get them imported and running. So another great thing about Python is that these modules are just Python files themselves. And we can view the location of a module just by printing out its dunder file method or it's dunder file attribute, I'm sorry. So if we print out os.dunder file, and dunder just means two underscores. And don't worry why those are double underscores, that'll be a topic for a future video. So if we run this, then we can see that it prints out the location of this file on our file system. And if we open up that Python directory where that file lives, then we could see the entire standard library. So I actually have this open right here. So let me open this up real quick. So I actually have open that Python 3.6 directory where the entire standard library lives. Now, I know that this may be a little small over here for you to see on my screen, um, but let's go ahead and look through a couple of these files. So these are all in alphabetical order. So one of the first files in the standard library is actually this anti-gravity module. Now this is kind of a joke in the Python community. So there, this is a module that you can import called anti-gravity that will open up a web comic on your machine. And even though this is part of the standard library, we can just open up this module here and see exactly how this is done. So we can see that basically it just imports this web browser module and opens up the web browser to this page here. And I know that people are probably going to be curious what this comic is now. So let's go ahead and import that. So back in intro.py, I'll just delete everything and do import anti-gravity and run this file then we can see it just opens up our web browser to this comic and I'll leave this open while we close out here. So if you get a chance, then don't be afraid to go into the standard library and look around at how different things are done. Um, it's a great way to learn. Now I'm not going to lie, there's definitely some complicated code in there, but you'll be surprised how much you can understand if you just poke around a bit. Okay, so I think that's going to do it for this video. So where do we go from here? So, so far in this series, we've covered a lot of the fundamentals in working with Python. So we've learned about different data types, conditionals, loops, functions, and importing modules, and a bit of the standard library. Now, I think that just about anyone would agree that no matter what specialty you plan on going into for Python, whether it's back-end web development, data science, building desktop applications, no matter what route you decide to take, you're going to need the fundamentals that we've covered up until this point. But now that you understand these fundamentals, the next topics that you learn 